should have kept you up while you were standing because we would ask that you stand for the reading of God's word. Revelations 21, 1 to 6. Then I saw a new heaven, a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death, no mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who has, he who was seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. And then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it's done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink, without cost from the spring of the water of life. The word of God for the people of God. You may be seated in the house of God. Our Father and our God, as we come, we come with thanksgiving in our hearts. We know that you have said in your word that you would make old things pass and create new ones. We don't understand your ways. We don't know what you have planned for us. So we pray that you will cause us to willingly adjust to that which is your will. In the name of Jesus, amen. Friends, recently, both the public square of the city of Cleveland and the bridge on Interstate 71 over the Cuyahoga River were replaced, made new. And so from this text, I want to talk to you for a few minutes about making everything new. You see, this is what the Lord said he was going to do. Mind you that prior to the coming of Christ, in order to make sacrifices and to show some appreciation for the will and the ways of God, to repent for sins and to seek God's favor, we sacrificed lambs birds, whatever one could afford to show a repentance. And then Christ came and did away with all of that, created a new thing, made things new by saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. I've come that you might have life and have life more abundantly. And so then the old things, the old ways passed away and the new 
things came. Now, back to the things that were made new here in the city of Cleveland. And if you go on the trolley rides, you will see a lot of new things downtown, the convention centers and the new hotels and all of the other things that they hope to show off. But remember that the general contract all subcontractors and all suppliers of materials and services for the projects, as well as the total cost for both projects, are available to the general public if properly requested because the projects are owned by the public. Now, there are some architects in this audience and architectural students. You'd appreciate that part of it. However, this is not the case with the new Jerusalem that John describes in the scriptures of the hour. You see, God is the creator. And God is the supplier. And God is the owner of everything that is, that John wrote about. All of creation belonged to God. Therefore, God answers only to himself. We have no way of challenging him, asking to see his book. He is the creator of it all. Now the book of Revelation is a major part of a brand of theology that treats of or is known uh, in seminaries and institutions of higher learning as eschatology. I'm going to spell that word for you. It's E S. C-H-A-T-O-L-O-G-Y, eschatology. This particular brand of theology treats of death, judgment, and the future state of the soul. Now we know more about death than we will ever know about judgment. We know more about judgment than we as living beings will ever know about the future of a human souls. Some great thinkers have said some things are humanly unknown as well as humanly unknowable. And so when we get into this business of eschatology, we are talking about some things that only God really knows. And God revealed some of these matters to St. John while he was exiled on the Isle of Patmos. And he's talking and writing about what vision he has seen. A few verses later, however, in this chapter 21 of Revelations, beginning specifically at verse 16, John provides a detailed description of the holy city, this new Jerusalem. Time does not permit in one message or one sermon the adequate coverage of John's vision as recorded in this passage of scripture. Therefore, let us consider briefly two aspects of St. John's recorded words. The first is aspect is that this holy city combines elements covered in previous scriptures. The holy city combines elements covered in previous scriptures. And I'll run through those in a minute. Secondly, we want to observe the awesome glamour of St. John's description of the holy city, this new Jerusalem. First, let us consider the holy city combined elements of the Garden of Eden, the temple, and the city of Jerusalem. In that order, the Garden of Eden contained no city, no temples. God dwelt with, among, and over creation, as well as his two original people, his two original people people, Adam and Eve. God was the only source and place of worship, the great creator, the sovereign Lord, the first and the last. Further, God supplied every need 
for his people. In short, it was just God with his people in the beauty of holiness. As the years passed, populations grew and cities were formed. The center of each Israelite and even each ancient Middle East city, the center was a temple. The temple was the centerpiece or focal point of society. Although at the time of the St. John's writing, many years had passed and the population of God's earth had dramatically increased, God was and God is still in control. Remember today, saints, God's still in control. The city of Jerusalem was for the Israelites the location of the great temple the main dwelling place of Yahweh. The temple stored grain, the tithes of the first fruits for the servants of God. The temple was the place with an altar for burning sacrifices to God. The temple was the place where only once each year the high priest could enter its holy of holies and petition God on behalf of the people. Now, St. John records, hearing a loud voice from the throne, saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men. Remember that in the Garden of Eden, the dwelling of God was with men. So if you go back and read that story, you'll find that, that God talked to Adam and Eve more to Adam and later on to, he had a conversation with Eve but mostly with Adam about Eve and the activities he will live with them they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God he will wipe away every tear from their eyes there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things passed away. Now consider the awesome glamour of the holy city. I'm going to ask the people in the video booth to give me an assist by flashing something on the screen so you can get an idea of what this looked like. You may not be able to read it carefully so I'm going to read it for you. You see the the first foundation when, that, that John talks about, he says that the, the wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. We normally talk about 24 karat gold. and That's about as much as will stand to be handled. If you get much more pure than that, it's soft and just simply does not lend itself to be made into jewelry. But here we're talking about pure gold. So he said the city was made of pure gold. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. And here's where we want to horn in. You get some idea about precious stones and how they were used in the theology and in the Bible. He says the first foundation was of jasper. So you say, well, what's jasper? Well, you know, Jasper in ancient times was a collective name for opaque stones, but it's clear that in the New Testament, Jasper is a crystal clear, transparent stone thought to be a high grade diamond. It is thus a fitting symbol to tell forth the glory of God. Jasper then is the stone of the breastplate and the first stone of the new Jerusalem. Christ's high priestly work will end and he will begin his administration, administration rule in his millennial kingdom. He shall come to his glory in his saints and be admired in all that 
believes. And you'll find that in 2 Thessalonians 1 and 10. And then the second foundation of this wall is made of sapphire. And you say, well, what in the world is sapphire? Well, sapphire is a bright blue color. It's the fifth stone of the breastplate and the second of the New Jerusalem. Like the blue color in the tabernacle, our thoughts are lifted to the glory of God, which shines perfectly in Christ Jesus. But the third foundation of the wall is a lighter blue called Chalcedony, a lighter blue color, and possibly pictures the heavenly people who Christ has redeemed. They are to, be ref are to reflect his glory and display his beautiful character. But the fourth foundation was emerald. Now all of us know about emerald. We look around and we talk about the emerald necklace and the, 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 the national parks and, and, and we, we admire the emerald stones on people's hands. Well, this emerald is one of the most beautiful of the precious stones. Its bright green color is the color of trees, grass, meadows, and also of life and expectation. It has a deep shine and a sparkling fire and is interpreted as a burning coal in the Greek. But the fifth foundation of that wall is onyx. Sub, we refer to it sometimes as sardonyx. And sardonyx is also called ruby. I mean, uh, sardonyx ha has white layers creating an artistic masterpiece. It is the eleventh stone in the high priest's breastplate and represents Joseph. And Joseph means he will add. The same stone was found on the shoulder piece of the ephod and the signified strength. It's the fifth stone in the New Jerusalem. And I mistakenly said a minute, a minute ago something about ruby. Ruby then is the sixth stone. Its technical name is Sardius. It's also called ruby and it has a very red color. And you've seen ruby and we talk about ruby reds and all of those things. Well you're beginning to get a view of what it will look like then in this new creation. And here's what then he talked about. And he go on down the line, he talked about the seventh stone being one of crystallite. And you know, it's interesting. You don't see much jewelry in crystallite. It's a greenish gold in color from the Greek gold stone. And you don't hear much about that stone, but it is in the wall there. And it is what we will have to look forward to one of these days when we, who are gathered with Christ, will find ourselves in the glamour and the beauty of the land. And then the eighth one is beryl. The beryl is, is the source of much sought after metal, beryllium which is used in rockets, jets, and nuclear reactors. This beautiful stone, sometime blue in color, and then called aquamarine. So you're gonna see that color too in this everything being made new. And then the ninth stone, topaz. And topaz has a, a rich yellow-orange luster. It's found on an island in the Red Sea which bears the name Topos, which means salt and fine. This reminds us of the one who found a treasure in a field and sold all that he had and bought it. You find that in Matthew 13 and 44. But the tenth one, tenth foundation of the wall is made of something called Christopher's. It is a 
an apple green color and translucent. It's found only in Revelation 21 and is describing the New Jerusalem and may be a reference to the wondrous fertility which will be evident through heaven and earth. And the 11th is Jason. Jacinth is a brilliant stone with excellent optical qualities, second only to the diamond. It spreads light, its various primary colors. It's the seventh stone of the breastplate and the 11th in the New Jerusalem wall foundation. And then you have amethyst as the 12th stone. And amethyst is a dark, violent color. Man, you will, may recall, mocked Jesus and clothed him in purple robe, Matthew 15 and 17. But he will come forth in judgment as the King of kings and the Lord of lords in that day. Even so, come Lord Jesus, Revelations 22 and 20. Now, having said all of that, about the foundation of the stone. The 12 gates, they said, were made of pearls. Can you imagine a pearl large enough to be made into a gate? We think of pearls as being those little stones we get out of the oysters. Can you imagine an oyster large enough to create that kind of a pearl? Well, God has all things in his control. And God can create pearls. He doesn't need the oyster. Remember, God created the oyster. And so here we go then with this large bit of a pearl being the size of a gate. But he said the great street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. Pure gold. I've never seen pure gold. I doubt if anyone here has ever seen pure gold. But when all things are made new, then we will see some things made of pure gold. Can you imagine a city that fit this description? Now mind you, the city had no budget, no cost concerns, no overruns, no supply problems, no shortages of supplies, no skilled craftsmen needed. Because you see, God is the creator and the maintainer of all that is. And so then we come to the real reason for looking at this. He said one day, on that day, that God himself would appear. Christ will make another trip. He'll come back in all of his splendor and all of the glamour. And so this is what we have to look forward to if we are obedient. First, we've got to hear the word of God. Then we've got to believe the word of God. And having heard the word of God and believed the word of God requires that we obey then the word of God. And so when Christ came and said in John, the 14th chapter, to his disciples, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. I go to prepare a place for you. Get an idea about what that place would look like according to the word of God. It said, and if I go and prepare this place for you, I'll come and receive you to myself. That where I am, you may be also. And so what we have to look forward to then is the coming of Christ and what he will do and what he will bring at that time. Now mind you that in all of this, Christ came in all of his glory, preached for all of those years. And people didn't pay too much attention. And if they didn't pay too much attention to him, why do you and I think that they will pay a great deal of attention to us? After all, he was Emmanuel, 
God with us. And they didn't pay any attention to Emmanuel, God with us. But that didn't stop him from coming, and so he came. And he dwelled on this earth for some three years. And they crucified him. And so if we find ourselves being sat upon, spat upon, verbally crucified and sometimes physically crucified, remember we are simply following the path established by Jesus Christ. Not only did they crucify him, kill him dead, but they buried him. And you know, he was so poverty stricken that he didn't have a grave, he didn't have a tomb. He borrowed one. You might say that if you're gonna rise again, you don't need one, you see? And so he just needed a tomb long enough to demonstrate to us what it's all about. So he went down there and they said he stayed there all day on Saturday. But early on Sunday morning, he returned to Joseph, that tomb that he had borrowed, and went back to be with the Father. And he said when he came back to his disciples, all power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. And don't just baptize them, but teach them everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I'm with you. I'm with you always. And that's where I want to leave you, my friends, that Christ is with us always. Thank you, Lord, for being with us always. Thank you for leaving your word. Thanking you for leaving us with the assurance that you would never leave us. And in times when we feel down and out, remind us again that you are with us. You've always been with us, 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 and you always will be with us. And you so loved us that you came and gave your life that those of us who believe will not perish but have life eternally. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. There may be somebody here today who heard